Hello and welcome to the State of Soy. I'm Aaron Putsey. Serving soybean farmers is what the Iowa Soybean Association is all about, and the American Soybean Association and United Soybean Board too. Working together, state and national soybean organizations represent the program and issue priorities of U.S. soybean farmers. What matters to you matters to us. It goes without saying that these are tough times for the soybean industry. Farmers are swimming upstream against all kinds of currents. There are trade wars, unprecedented flooding in key soybean producing states, and uncooperative weather. Then there's African swine fever outbreaks in key international markets, delays in action on biofuels and market development, and well, you get the picture. Growing soybeans isn't for the faint of heart, but it's times like this that test the metal and prove the worth of the United Soybean Board and the American Soybean Association. In a special two-part conversation on the state of soy, I'm pleased to welcome Polly Rulin, Chief Executive Officer of the United Soybean Board, and Ryan Finley, Chief Executive Officer of the American Soybean Association. First of all, welcome Polly, welcome Ryan to Iowa and the Midwest, the heart, as we like to say, of soybean country. So I want to get right to um, the, the issues, uh, Polly, but, but before we do, I think it would be helpful to first explain or describe the United Soybean Board and why soybean farmers should care about what you do. Well, the United Soybean Board, of course, is the soybean checkoff. And it's a 100% farmer-funded program, and farmers always pay the check off when they sell beans. And that program makes sure that farmers have markets for their, for their product, makes sure that the research that needs to be done on soybeans is done. Research, marketing, promotion, education, that's what the board does for farmers. I think when these, when these checkoff programs, and there are about 23 of them for all different kinds of commodities, when they were invented, Farmers said, listen, we need somebody to mine the supply chain. We need somebody to mine the demand side when we're on our farms making the raw material. And that's why checkoff pro programs were invented, and that's why we still exist today. And, and for, for farmers who have not been uh, involved or, or perhaps, in, and we know that there, farmers have a lot going on, and this spring has been a, a spring to forget mm -hmm. in, in many places, in many locations. Why should they care about what you're doing day to day and, and how it impacts their bottom line? Well, you mentioned a lot of the challenges that we have this spring particularly, but we always have challenges in maintaining demand for soy and soy products. And maintaining that demand is where the checkoff works best. Uh, farmers can't pay attention to the other side, to the consumer side. Uh, so we pay attention to the demand side so that we can continue to pull soybeans through the chain instead of try to push them from the supply side. So that's what checkoffs do best. Well, we're looking forward to getting the, into the, some of the specifics of those programs. And I, I want to shift and ask the very same question of you, Ryan, from the American Soybean Association standpoint. So Polly gave a little bit of an insight and glimpse into what the mm -hmm. checkoff side of the right. soybean industry is all about. Obviously, as the leader of the American Soybean Association, we're talking about non-checkoff. So explain a little bit about the difference there. And again, why does it matter to the average farmer out there in places like uh, Boone, Iowa, mm -hmm. Cresco, Iowa, uh, West Bend, Iowa. Why does it matter? Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. American Soybean Association is the policy side. When we're looking at federal policy, whether that is talking to elected officials in the U.S. House of Representatives or the U.S. Senate, working with our regulators at USDA or EPA, or even engaging directly with the White House, that's the, the mission of ASA is to focus on the policy side. And no shortage of issues. No, right it's now. Been busy. Uh, yeah. So uh, it, it, you've been on board now with the American Soybean Association for about a year. Yep. Just and a year. Uh, what's been one of the biggest surprises in, in, in the time that you've been with ASA? I, I think clearly the trade issue has been the biggest surprise. I mean, we all knew that we know that trade is important. We knew that uh, the Trump administration was going to be very engaged on a lot of trade issues. The level of of surprises within all of the trade issues, whether that's Japan or China or Mexico and Canada, has, has just surprised me. It's, it is every single day we have a new trade issue to deal with. So something that may not be surprising uh, to folks is the uh, very low approval rating that Congress has. I think it's in the maybe in the high teens, yeah. perhaps. 
Right. So tell us something good that is happening in Congress right now, that something that they have acted on that has an impact in a positive way on soybean farmers. Right, I know it doesn't always seem like they're paying attention, but I, I think members of Congress, especially in the Midwest, pay attention to their constituents. They're, they recognize that agriculture in the countryside is in a lot of pain right now. And recently, last week, we saw Congress, actually earlier this week, we saw the House of Representatives finally pass a disaster bill, which is really helpful. That recognizes wildfires and hurricanes and the flooding that we've experienced. And I really think that's a tribute to members of Congress paying attention to what's going on in the countryside. So speaking of being in the countryside and what's going on there, Polly, so you travel a lot and you visit with a lot of soybean growers and, and you know in your interaction with farmers and with directors uh, better than anyone the difficulties right now. So what are, what are you hearing from soybean farmers? How is their mood? We, we know farmers are resilient, but there isn't even a limit to that. But what are you hearing from soybean farmers and, and what are you sensing right now in your role leading the USP? Well, I'll tell you, um, farmers are, um, it's an unprecedented type of challenge situation for farmers right now. But I am always amazed, always amazed when you get challenges like this, how resilient and optimistic particularly soybean farmers can stay. I, I will tell you that's one of the surprises I had when I came into this job from working with other commodities previously that soybean farmers are are optimistic and forward thinking and visionary even in times when they are incredibly challenged uh, and that's these this is one of those times I talked to a farmer this week who said that uh, in the state of Arkansas he had seen some data that perhaps 30 percent of farmers might go out of business this year in the state of Arkansas that is a sobering sobering statistic and so the most concern I, I hear from farmers right now is uh, how many farmers are we going to lose in this? And, and what is going to be the, the, the impact to the structure of the soybean complex long term, uh, depending on what percentage of farmers just can't make it through this challenge? And I think we're going to see repercussions in, in the infrastructure of soybeans in this country for many, many years. So we are at a critical time. Uh, for the for the future of soy, and I think never, never is anything is the challenge and the opportunity more important for organizations that can help soybean farmers than in times of great crisis, and that's what I tell my board is great crisis offers great opportunity, and and farmers get that they really do. You know, it's very well said, and, and I know for organizations like ours that are so keyed into serving growers and being responsive to their needs, they don't, they don't really need to see you when times are really good. The time that they really need to see you is when there's, when there's difficult times, and, 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 and years like this is where we really have to be present and accounted for. That's when they, they find out, again, the true value of the uh, investment that they're making. Could you explain the structure? How is USB put together? Sure. So USB uh, has a board of 73 farmers, and those farmers are appointed by the Secretary of Agriculture. And those farmers make the decisions about the investments of the 570,000 or so soybean farmers that there are in the rest of the country. So the decisions we make, the investments we make in all sorts of programs, are always, always made by the farmer board. The farmer board is made up um, basic, on, on, the representation is how many soybeans are grown in each state. So higher grow, higher farmer representation on our board. I think it's very important that people understand that checkoff programs are often, and Ryan can speak to this too, are often in D.C. represented as taxpayer programs. Um, checkoff programs are 100% funded by farmers. Even the part that USDA oversees, we repay the government for those uh, for those types of uh, activities. So um, those that's really important to the structure. We have a committee structure that feeds into the board decisions and dives deeper into the investments, uh, and and an executive committee then that manages business and in, in in between the board. So. Uh, all I can emphasize as far as USB goes is that farmers make the decisions, farmers run the organization, and the staff at USB is honored and dedicated to serving the farmers that are on the board and, and all the farmers in the country. And it's critical because everything that you do goes back to the farm, 
not only in terms of the programs that you're implementing, but also the direction that you're given, the input that you're giving. And I think more than ever, it's extremely important that farmers understand that their investment uh, and their voice is what drives the organization and the decision making. And on the policy side of it as well, your structure, again, very accountable to the individual farmer and those that are investing in that policy work. Yeah, I think Polly said it best when she said farmers are optimistic, but they're also visionary. And all of these organizations, so if you look at USB, if you look at ASA, there was, there was vision by farmer leaders before us that said these are really important. And so 100 years ago, ASA was established, and at that time it was very much, how do we improve soybean production in the United States. There were a lot of people that didn't know how to grow soybeans. And early on, that was, that was the mandate that ASA had. Today, it is very much a policy focus. It's still driven by farmers. We have 54 farmer leaders on our board of directors. They set our, our policy agenda. They drive forward and engage with members of Congress. It's the beauty and the strength of our organization. We're not going to walk into Washington, D.C. and write a big check we're going to walk into Washington, D.C. and say, this is a farmer constituent, and they need to have a conversation about this issue that impacts them on the tractor seat.